And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Mariko Frederick, former nurse and alternative healer who died at home and had an amazing journey in the afterlife. Mariko, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Well, Mariko, can we start on the day you died and go from there? Sure. So I died at home, as you said, and I remember, you know, I didn't know, you you, you don't really know what's happening, or I, I will say I, you know, didn't know exactly what was happening. I just felt a weight on my chest. Like, it was so hard to breathe. And I just felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. And I just remember breathing up and down and like pushing this elephant up and like letting it fall, right? It was like a weight up and down, up and down. And there was a moment where I just thought, I think I'll stop. And it's interesting because in that moment, I both knew that that meant I was going to die, but I also knew that I wasn't. And there was no fear. Um, so it was more, I would say my near-death experience is, felt more like a spiritual experience. It was like a beautiful spiritual experience. There was no fear. And then I did, I just stopped. And I remember, you know, I think for me, maybe others too, I don't know, but my personality came with me there for a minute. I hadn't separated, you know, ego yet. So my first thought was, oh, that's so much better. You know, breathing's really overrated. <laughs> so I, I just felt like so much peace. And I remember hearing my heart stop beating. And there was this buzzing sound that I didn't know I had. It was very quiet, but it went away. And I don't know if that was my nervous system or what that was, but it was this buzzing sound that just slowly faded. And then that's when I saw this beautiful light shining at my forehead. Um, The only way I could describe it, it was like a thousand sun shining at me, but it wasn't too bright. It was like, it was like it would, it had always been there and it felt very natural and welcoming and just love. And so I went through like I was, I don't know if I went through it. It wasn't like a tunnel per se, but it was like, I was in it. And I remember saying, you know, goodbye to my husband and my family, um, just a heartfelt gratitude. And, and just, there was no grief. There was no sadness. It was like so much love and just feeling like everyone was going to be okay. And I'm just going to step on the other side of this veil. You know, I'll see you in a minute. I'm just going to step over here. It didn't feel like this long separation to me. Um, so that, that was, you know, just to jump right into it, that was the first moment for me, I suppose. And then beyond that, that's when I think when I left, I could say I left this world, so to speak. And I did step beyond the veil. Um, and it does, it feels like this thin veil between us and the other side. It, it, you know, here in our physical body, it feels like a really big deal. It feels, you know, like it's permanent when you die. And I think for, for me experiencing it, it was like, oh, there is no death. It, for me, I woke up to the truth of who I really am. And it was beautiful. So I went through the other side and then I went into my life review. And that started out, you know, really all the way from birth until, until that moment. And I got to see every moment and experience it both as me and the person I was interacting with. And it wasn't every second, you know, I brushed my teeth and tied my shoes. You know, it was like the big moments of decision and interaction, these big moments in life. So moments that I helped somebody, some moments that I was healing somebody, moments of compassion. Like I got to re-experience that from my perspective and the person that I was interacting with. And it was beautiful. And then I also got to see those moments that I wasn't, you know, my best self (laughs) where I was, you know, out of alignment. And the first one interesting was when I was in kindergarten and I was with a friend of mine and we're in front of our house and I was being mean to her on purpose. I, you know, I go, I wrote a book and I, I go into it, but basically, you know, she saw these paw prints in the cement in front of our house. And I went off on her about how the paw prints were a dog that died. And she was kind of laughing at them. And I was like, well, you know, and this is me, me being mean on purpose, you know, to be totally vulnerable. I was like, well, how would you like it if you died and everyone laughed at you? And like, I think I was just, I don't know, I was like five, you know, five years old. And I think even at that time, though, like we feel this inner power and we play with it, right? At least that's how I can express it in human language here today. And I relived that moment in my NDE. That was 
the first time that I was, you know, out of alignment with my soul and living out of ego. And I got to experience it as her. And I remember her just being so sad. Like, why is she being so mean to me? I don't understand. And I was hurting her feelings. Um, so I got to relive that whole thing too. And there's no judgment though. You know, there's, it's like, you feel yourself, you feel the other person, and then you feel that, you know, whatever you call it is perfect. God, divine consciousness, oneness, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, the universe was also witnessing it. And it was totally impartial, no judgment, just unconditional love watching this whole thing play out. And I was learning to never do that again. And then I also, I also got to see the parts where I help people, right? Um, maybe when I was working in the trauma intensive care and some of the things and the ways that I behaved there was kind of comes back to you, but like, you know, just, I don't even know, like infinite bliss coming at you as like gratitude, like the universe saying, good job. You know, we couldn't even hold it in these bo this body, how much gratitude and love can come at you. It's really beautiful. So then that was where I think going through that entire experience, basically, it, it, you know, to, to wrap it up, I got to experience me when I was aligned with my soul and when I wasn't. And then you get to you get to see like, okay, I, I want more of that. I want less of that. Right. So it was beautiful. How did you come back? So that's not even, sorry, that's not even the end of the story. That was just like the, that part. So then after that, I get taken, it, you know, it's so funny because we don't have time. There's no linear time on the other side and there's no this or that. But I almost want to say I went deeper, if I may. It, that's not the right word, but it's kind of how it felt, right? More further away from the living being I was, you know, as Mariko incarnate, it, kind of a little bit further from that. So then I, I, I sort of detach from the physical being, detach from identity. And, you know, I go through this experience where there, I see sort of a silhouette version of something, a person kind of floating and moving down into this circular bright tube of light. And I remember feeling that there were beings around me and I said, what's that? And they said, it's the part of you that gets attached. And so we just slowly watched this go through this tube of light. And then things got interesting. Then it was like getting, it's, it's so interesting to go through this again, getting downloaded by these beings. Um, and there was no words on the other side in, in the sense that we use our human words. There was no, people ask me a lot, what did you see? And we don't see with our human eyes anymore, but we see with our soul, if that makes sense. You see, you see so clearly, but not in the way that we see now. And so I felt like I was being downloaded by these beautiful beings, um, information that I would need later, but they didn't tell me what it was. I, I just felt it coming into me. And then after that, I remember just feeling like I'm free. I'm me. Like, this is who I really am. This is who I've always been. Right. And I was never Mariko. I was never practicing alternative medicine. I was never a rock climber. Like all of those identities that I had just fell away and I was me and I was love. Right. And I remember, I guess it, it, again, it's, interesting to express it in a human language, sort of a, a non-human experience, if, if you will. I felt like I was standing out watching the universe and just filled with bliss and thinking, I am love. I am joy. I am bliss. I was never any of these identities I had. And I am one with all beings everywhere. We are one. There is no one else, right? And just feeling so much love for everybody, not just human, but like everybody in the universe, just feeling that oneness connection. And at that point is when I heard, although I call it a thought wave because it was like a wave of, of it was like a wave of a thought coming at me. And then I, I guess you could say I heard it um, of, of them saying, it's not your time. You have to go back. And of course, me being me, I was like, uh-uh, <laughs> no, I'm good. And it, it was sort of that vibration back of resistance, if you will. And then they said it again. It's not your time. You have to go back, go back and help people. And again, I was like, nope, I'm good. 
because I'm bliss, go back and be who, you know, at that point, I felt like I'd been there for hundreds of years. And again, there's no time. So it's hard to say infinite time and then break it down to, you know, hundreds of years. It doesn't make sense. But I was there long enough to where when they were saying, go back and help people, I'm like, go back and be who do what? This is me. Why would I go be anybody else? I am my true identity. And now you want me to go be something else. I don't know what you're talking about. And then they really got into it a little bit more and they, you know, and the whole time they're just infusing you with love. So you're like, oh, of course I'll do anything. And they said to you, it's not your time. And what they told me anyways, was everybody has a time and you can't leave before and you can't leave after. And this isn't your time. You have to go back and help people. Now I will say in that people have asked me because there's so much, there's so many questions. I felt they didn't tell me but I felt like there were windows where you could leave. But the best option is for you to stay as long as you can and get as much done here as you can. Um, and at that, you know, being filled with love and go back and help people. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then I, I was like, I, I can't get back in my body. Like, it's not like you have a, it's not like you've done this before. And you're like, sure, I'll go do that. You know, I didn't know how. So I just said, I, I can't get back in my body. I don't, I don't know how. And so I just remember feeling hurled through space. Like there was movement and I was moving very fast. And then I just, boom, slammed back in my body and took a breath and raking pain, horrid pain. And at that point, you know, everything returned, ego, physical body, all of that was back. And I, my first thought, of course, was I need to go to the hospital. And then they kind of, again, it's hard to describe, but it was like they pulled me back, not like I died again, but it was almost like they pulled me back into that bliss. And they said, don't use Western medicine, which was really hard to hear coming from a medical background. I was like, it was hard to hear. My, like the human in me was hard. It, I didn't want to hear that. But the experience was like, yeah, okay. That, I, I will follow that. You know, I'm not going to mess with that. So that was, it was hard. Do you feel that your NDE was an accident or it was planned pre-birth? Wow, I've never been asked that before. Um, I feel like that's such a great question. I feel like it was planned because everything that I was meant to go back and help people with, I already had, and I was not going to talk about this until this happened. And it kind of opened up the awareness in me that you need to go share more about you know, the instructions, remember who you are and go back and help people. And that's a little more significant um, for me in, in what that meant to me anyways. And so I think it's a great question, but I, it had to have been planned because in some ways I also want to say, you know, as much as the universe is, is there's chaos, it's, there, there's no mistakes. Do you know who the beings were that were assisting you on the other I side? I don't. It's not like I, it's interesting because yes, I do. In some ways it was so familiar and it wasn't like I could say, oh, it was like family. It was like spirit guide. It was like, you know, it, it, but it was like these beings knew me and I knew them. And there was such a deep connection and so much unconditional love. Could I tell you their names? No. Can I tell you what they look like? No. Cause it didn't have physical appearance. Um, it wasn't even a light appearance. I couldn't even tell you like, you know, sometimes there's light beings. It was just. It was just these power, the uh, presence. Um, yeah, but I can't tell you like exactly who they were in a way that makes sense. Because when I say, uh, like, if, if I think and say, oh, well, maybe they were my spirit guides, you know, my intuition is like, no, it was something more than that. I get the impression that while you were there, your identity here was completely meaningless to you. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It, it, it just, it's like, it's like wearing a costume, you know, and then you come into your, you wake up to the truth of who you are. And you know, I don't say meaningless in like the people and all the experiences are meaningless. That wasn't, but all the personality traits, all the things that you think you love, right? Um, for me at the time, I was an avid rock climber, really identified with being a rock climber, really loved practicing, you know, Chinese medicine, very identified with that. And all the things that I thought made up me, oof, gone. 
And it, it, it's like, you know, taking off an outfit and going, oh, that wasn't really me. This is me. What about your accomplishments? Like, let's say, getting your degrees or if you climb some really tall mountain, did those yeah. even become meaningless as well? Yeah, not meaningless in a negative way, but but in a way that's like not me. It's like not even me. So it, it, the idea of certain things that we're really attached to, take money, for example, right? Everybody's generally at some level attached to money because we need it to buy food or mm -hmm. shelter, right? Whether you're rich or poor, we, in this current reality that we're in, and hopefully we transcend this to where we're not so dependent on things like that. But right now we are to buy food and shelter and clothes. The concept of money went away. Boom, gone. Nobody cares how much you made. But you are unlimited in abundance because you're unlimited. You, you are an unlimited being. So whatever you want, you can create. You can pull that in if you want. Um, but the idea of money doesn't matter. The only thing I took with me, and I think for everybody, the only thing we take with us is our spiritual progress. It's the only thing you're taking with you. Were you in some type of unified field where you knew everything, but you just couldn't bring it back with you? Yes. What a great way to put that. Yes. When I was looking at, when I told you it felt like I was there for hundreds of years, it was like tapping into the oneness of the reality that the universe is love, is bliss, is joy, and having access to all of that. But the stuff that really matters not the stuff that we make matter here in the human realm. And it's interesting because a lot of people, and I'm feeling a lot of your listeners also know a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. The things that we think matter, all the commercialism and think that like, it doesn't really matter. It's nice to have, you know, everybody wants to be comfortable if you can, but it doesn't matter. So yeah, tapping into that oneness of our true identity and what really matters is it was there for me, sure. And I think it's there for everybody. After you came back, did you notice that you had any new abilities that you didn't have prior that could be considered to be psychic? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I was psychic before, again, practicing alternative medicine. And we talked and I know that you had also practiced. And you know, I think we have a lot of intuition that we used. And, you know, when I came back, it wasn't fun, though. Like I was sick. It was not fun. It took a decade to have to be able to do something and not run out of, like to just know that I can do something consistently. It, it took a decade of, it, it felt like I was chasing after the woman I was meant to be. Like I just, it, I was battling chronic illness and other things were happening. It was not fun. Um, but I came back and I didn't pick up on it right away because, you know, for me, and I don't like this anymore, but for me, I really just kind of wanted to fit in. I didn't want to just be normal. You know, and but I had this interesting, uncanny ability to know what people are meant to do with their lives. Um, and so I would just be on the phone with somebody and be like, you should do this. You should do that. You should do I'm just like getting downloaded of what they should do, like what their soul assignment is, what it is that, that would be the best thing for them to how how to best express their soul, what they should create from their soul. And so I, I felt like that, you know. Was really tuned up. I don't know that I had it to that degree before. Yeah. And then I think the other thing was just the clarity of what I'm really here to do and share, even though I was still a little resistant. I was definitely resistant. Yeah. Well, at some point in your life, you got the ability to see your in-between lives. How did you do that? I've always had it. I thought everyone did. Honestly, I was born like that. I remember I stayed completely conscious between my last life and this life. And I thought everyone did. I thought it was totally normal. I didn't know it wasn't normal until I was like 18 or 19. I, I And I can't remember exactly what age. I think I may have, I feel like it was like fall and I was about to turn 19. Um, but I didn't know it until I was talking to somebody and he told me, because I was like, oh, the place before with all the lights that we are before we are born. And I was just going into a conversation with him because here I'm talking to this, what, what I'm probably at the time I wouldn't have the language for, but, you know, talking to somebody who was a higher conscious being thinking like, oh, we'll just have this talk. And this is years ago. People didn't talk like this. And I just remember him saying like, whoa, like people don't know, they don't talk about that. They don't know what you're talking about. 
And again, I'm a teen. I still kind of want to fit in. You know, I very much wanted to fit in and be normal, knowing maybe that I had this thing with me. And so I sort of stopped talking about it for 10 years until I, until I had that NDE. And even then I didn't talk about it. There was no podcast. There was no book. There was no, it was like, a, it was like a knowing you've got to do this one day. And that was it. And I just, but I was too sick to do anything. It's not like, you know, you, you come back and you know how to do, you know, a website or, or how to articulate in human language, what happened. So it took a long time, but yeah, I stayed conscious. So I remember everything that happens. I'll say to me, because I think mo I will say to me and a lot of people, but I won't say everybody because basically when you leave this world and this is what happened to me in my last life, I, when I died, went through the life review and then I went into the higher realm called the astral realm where everything is made of light. This is, you do get to see your family and friends, um, spent a long time there. Um, and then moved on into an even higher realm called the causal realm. And this is a realm of thought. This is where like some of the most ancient beings are there and they were creating their own realms. They were, they were literally creating, that wasn't what I was doing, but they were creating their own realms. So that just kind of blows my mind every time I think about it. Um, and from there, I went into oneness consciousness. And then I was, and then I remember feeling so much love. And, and this is a separation, right? I'm, I'm really like fast forwarding through this, but going from being love, I am love, I am one with everything to, oh, I feel so much love. Oh, I feel so much love. And then the realization, there's so much love in my heart. And then, oh, I have a heart. Oh, I'm separate from love and I have a heart and I feel love. Oh, I'm a baby. Oh, here I am. And so I thought everyone had that same journey and I would talk about it because I just didn't know. Did you ever talk about it with your family? Yeah, I tried to. I mean, I would just talk about it like normal. You know, like for me going to bed, I, I, I probably was easy to put to bed as a little and you and I both have kids. And it's like, there's that funny meme out there that nobody has a bigger to-do list than a toddler at bedtime. <laughs> it's, like, it's very true. And uh, it, for me, nighttime was amazing because you turn off the lights and I would see all the astral lights, right? So for me, even to this day, you know, and this morning I woke up early before the sun came up. And to me, like my room is just filled with white lights, like little white lights. And the same as a kid, they, they had more color back then. Um, so I would talk about it, but everyone, I, I think really, I felt like it was taboo to talk about as I got older, I realized older, meaning like, you know, preschool, like, oh, I don't think people talk about this. And then I realized, I don't think people remember this. And again, Hey, I'm human. I want to be normal. You know, you go through high school, you're not trying to, maybe now because things are, I think in, in, even though the world looks a little crazy, I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of more people are coming into a higher consciousness. And so it's okay to talk about these things. Now it's accepted. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. I and mean, back then it was a little weird and I didn't, I didn't really want to be that, that kid, you know? Did you notice during your in-between life that you made any type of soul contract? I remember speaking to my spiritual teacher and everything's telepathic though. You're not talking with human words in the same way and planning my life. And I remember this soul behind me and my husband and I, who would these souls, I won't say husband and daughter, but like the people that I recognize when we incarnate, they will be my family. And I remember in that astral realm, still also playing the role of the healer. And so people would come to me in this astral meadow and I would heal them sometimes. Um, as far as like, you know, soul contracts with other people, you know, you think about the woman who technically was responsible for, for, I guess you could say, you know, injuring me to the point of a near death experience. I don't remember having that soul contract with her. The, the man who abused me when I was little, I don't remember that. No, I think that would have made life a little easier if I did. <laughs> no. I remember the big things, right? I remember, well, I don't remember like I forgot most of it, right? Like you asked me that question. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't remember that. But I do remember being on that realm, that planet, if you will. And then also we don't only incarnate on those. That's why I said most people go there, not everybody. So there are lower realms and there are higher realms. Earth in my experience is a sea average planet. We're not that great. 
and there are lower realms and there are higher realms. And so some beings are just incarnating on higher realms. They go here, they go to a higher realm, they come back, right? And they're not only going there. And so I feel like there's a lot of beings here, probably listening to your show, who have been incarnating on higher realms. They are higher realm beings. And now they're here and it's like, oh my gosh, what is going on? What do I do? And it's time to wake up because here's the thing. There are lower realm beings and I'm not saying they're bad, but they act according to their nature, according to where they're at, right? According to where they're at consciously. So they're incarnating on lower realms. They come here. They're working their way up here. They get to earth. Yay. Okay. I'm, co I'm conscious enough to be on earth now. Okay. Oof, see average now. I was getting enough before. Now I'm see average. Now they forget who they are and they start behaving according to their nature. And then they start creating things like genocide and bad things that are happening, right? I don't want to name them all because they're just heavy. Then there are beings that are incarnating on lighter realms, different realms, different dimensions. And they come here and they forget who they are, just like me. And they kind of like want to act human and just be normal and fit in. Or maybe not. That was my experience. Some people don't. But still, I feel like the programming here is to like, you know, you're raised, you go to school, you get a job. You do things that are very human, but I feel like there are people here that are from higher realms that are here to create and bring something that the world hasn't seen before. And for me, it, you know, what I want to say to them is it's time to start acting according to your true nature. Stop acting so human. Start acting like the higher realm being you are because the world needs you because the lower realm beings, again, I'm not saying bad or good. I'm saying they have no problem acting like their true nature. And somehow higher realm beings come here and, and they kind of want to act a little more normal. Do you think that the population on this planet is in the majority of lower or higher realm beings? No, like I said, I feel like there's like a, a lot of them are kind of sea average, like the, the masses. And then I feel like there's a spark in each one that's like, can wake up and go into that higher. Cause we're, you know, in my experience, the only desire to have is enlightenment. Like you want to get into the highest state of consciousness because that's your true self. I don't care what realm you're from. Your truest expression of your soul, of yourself is to be the highest conscious version of you that you can be. So even people that are probably kind of see average, they're meant to raise their consciousness. And same with the lower realm being, like we're all trying to move up. What I'm saying is the people that you know who you are, like you know your higher realm. You know, you know that. So stop acting so human, right? Start shining that intergalactic light because the world needs you to start leveling everybody up, start bringing up the, the vibration everywhere. It's not a bad or good. It's not like, it's just where you're at, the, the nature of, because we're all one, right? So people have said, well, you know, oh great, there's a hierarchy and that, you know, it's not that. It's kind of like saying some people, if, if we're all one, some people are at the eyes and some people are at the knees and some people are at the toes but we're all one. It's not bad or good because it's interesting. We have that duality here, but there, we don't have duality on the other side. Bad, good, you know, it, it, there's no duality. We're just one. Do you ever think about how does a person wind up as a lower realm being? Such an interesting question because it, again, we're all one. So in the human realm, we want to say, oh, they were bad, you know, and they went to hell and they were the you know, I don't know. I don't want to name all the names because I don't like to give, I don't like to give power to that. But some of the lower things that have happened on this earth throughout history, and we can say they were bad. But as oneness consciousness, we're all playing our part. And so it, this is, it kind of blows my mind because I, you know, I can, the human in me can be judgmental too, right? We all have that tendency. So we can, we can, from, from, um, one standpoint, we can say, okay, well, they were behaving badly. They're lower vibrational beings, and that's where they belong because they did bad things. Hurt people, right? Genocide, trafficking, all those bad things. And then in the oneness reality, all of that goes away because there is nobody else. There is no, there is no duality. So then it's like that unit of God's consciousness is incarnating and playing the role of, of, of a villain, which helps all of us say, wow, we don't want that. Let's raise the collective. So it, it's, it's like, in some ways they serve by pushing us up by saying, wow, time to wake up here. This is not okay. We need to come together as a collective and raise the collective consciousness. 
I think you have the ability to teach people how to also access their in-between lives. Is that correct? Yeah, kind of. I don't teach it so much as I, I mean, I would love to figure out that. I've been asking them to help me do that, but I created something called astral therapy and that's my own trademark modality, if you will, um, where I, through my, it's called astral therapy. I, I hesitate to call it a visual, visualization because I'm bringing you up into the higher realms so that you can experience who you are in the higher realms. Now, you know, I go in my Facebook group and I do it for free once a month where I just bring people up into the astral, help them get clear on their purpose, clear anything that's blocking them. And then we come back down. And then, you know, with clients that I work with for longer, we were doing, you know, opening up, you know, going into their higher realm, opening up dimensions and all sorts of things are happening. But it's more of like, I I want people to remember, you know, just as my, my, um, instructions were remember who you are go back and help people i feel like that's for everybody i want you also to remember who you are and go back and help people and if i can help them by helping like bringing them back into the astral realm even if for them they're like yeah i stopped by there and then i went to the higher realm still it wakes that up oh yeah oh yeah i remember what this looks like i remember what this feels like okay now i truly remember who i am now i have that that connection so that's what that is that's that's how i like to help people well, how are you bringing them into the higher realms? Like there's some type of guided meditation? Yeah, I guess you can call it that. Visualization, guided meditation. Um, for the people who have experienced it, they experience it though. So I almost hesitate to call it a visualization because they're actually there. And it's it's a beautiful experience. And I think the how is, you know, if you had been somewhere and nobody else had been there that you know, I'm not saying nobody else has been there. I'm just saying, you know, I remember it, you would be just guiding them because you know the directions. And so for me, going into the higher realms is like going to my kitchen. It's not hard. It's not, um, it's just normal for me. I, again, no one told me it wasn't normal. I didn't know until I was 19. So for me, it's just been kind of this normal, normal thing I do. When they're there, do they connect with their higher self? And then they become aware of limiting beliefs? You know, it's, it's interesting because it's their experience, not mine. I'm the guide. And then we get there and I'll see like, oh, this is your higher self or, oh, this is your, this is your guide. And then from there, we might go into a space of going into their realm that they've been incarnating more often, um, opening up that portal and going into the realm and then sometimes meeting their intergalactic team, intergalactic spirit guides, whatever you want to call that. So it gets a little, it, it, it it's just, it can be mind blowing, honestly, even for me and I'm doing it. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. You're amazing. You know, the beings that come to me, I'm like, you're so amazing to see who they are. So then they got to experience and remember. And then it's not just me telling them. It's them having that experience of, oh, okay. So, it almost but, you know, like I said, the first step is just go back to that astral. And some people, I think, just do that as well. I think people see, you know, I was talking to somebody else online the other day and and you know he also mentioned that he sees the astral lights when the you know in the dark his whole life i'm like yeah you're seeing that the other side there's there, a lot of people see that i think maybe not a lot but yeah good amount it almost seems like you're doing hypnotherapy with people as well i consider it the opposite of hypnotherapy because instead of going into the subconscious i want you to go into the higher mind i want to bring you into like more of the causal body where thoughts are created and then, yes, I do clear out any traumas that happened in this life or past lives. And then anchor in, I call it an astral imprint, anchor in what you want more access to in this life. Are people telling you what they see while you're guiding them? Yeah, it's fun. We're having a conversation, like when I'm one-on-one, -on -one, not with a group, because that would be hard. But yeah, I mean, I'm saying, you know, I'm seeing it. And then I'll say, like, do you see that? And then we'll talk about the things that we're seeing, but it's the same thing. I'm not telling them what I see. We're talking, having a conversation. Do you see that? And then this, oh my gosh, did you notice that? And so, you know, we're up there having a conversation. And I want, if anything, I don't want you in a deep sleep like hypnotherapy. I want you awake, awake, awake. Like I want you to wake up to who you are. So for me, it's the opposite in some ways of hypnotherapy. And then we go and yes, we do clear a lot of, of big, I go to the big things. I don't want to clear every single past life. I want to go to the root and clear that so that you're, you're good to go. You have a method about the four soul archetypes. Can we start with what are those archetypes? 
Yeah. So that's what I got in my near death experience. And let me tell you, it was, you know, it was like being handed a box and not being able to open it for years and knowing that I have this assignment on my soul and not being able to do anything about it. Like, what is it? I don't know. I don't know. And then one day it just came. And the four soul archetypes in, and I will be humble and say, I'm still unpacking and understanding, right? More information still comes to me. I was talking to my husband the other day and he was like, wow, I never heard you talk about it in that way. And I'm like, I'm still getting downloaded on like what all of this is, but it's, it's a way to connect your daily life to your soul so that whether you're working or, you know, um, teaching or parenting, you can see like, I, this is the archetype I'm connected to right now. So everybody has four soul archetypes. They're all four and they're all with you all the time. Um, you don't have more of one or less of one and you do have all four. So there is the reflector archetype. The reflector soul, ar soul archetype is, I mean, I'm gonna say the part of you cause you have all of it and you've always had all of it. I didn't invent this. I'm just getting the language to express this. The reflector archetype is the part of you that sees the truth in all beings. And you see the potential in beings. And I would say one of the problems that reflector archetypes have is that you see the highest truth in the being in front of you. And you don't always see that the human that they're behaving like. So you can kind of get tangled up in some toxic relationships sometimes because you're only seeing their brightest and best. And so, but the reflector archetypes really do see the truth in all beings. The connector archetype, that is the part of you who is here to connect your soul with something bigger, right? So, but distilling that down, I often tease and say that your connector archetype is your moneymaker. This is the part of you that's like, how can I go and create or do something that I am connecting my soul with a way to behave in this world every day, in a way to express myself? So connector archetypes, um, I always say that they have like a a contact list of all the people that you need. So they really love like getting, if, if you need something, if somebody has an idea, right. And they're just kind of hiding over here and the connector archetypes like, Oh, let me set you up with all the right people. And let me get you out there. Oh, this is your gift. Let me monetize that for you. I'll teach you how to monetize it. I see how you can live in alignment with your soul and make some money doing what you're here to do. Right. So that's the connector archetype. Um, the, re the, um, expander archetype, a lot like you, Hey, let me get you on my podcast. Let me, I see you, I see who you really are. I see the gift and let me share that with the world and the expander archetypes. I'm just going to out you here for a second. Cause you're here, Jeff, um, expander archetypes. They are brilliant at great, creating big audiences, right? Like they, they do PR, they do podcasts, they do things like this speaking, and they always put other people in the spotlight. But here's the thing about connect or expander archetypes. And again, we have all of them, but the, I feel like there's one that we live in more. Like I'm always a reflector archetype for me. That's like breathing. So for you, clearly I think expander archetype is like easy for you. Right. And I think it's so easy to put everybody else on stage and shine that spotlight on them. But really the, the power with an expander archetype is when you step on stage, because what happens is like, you expand a path that was not there before. Like we're all do, 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 do. We get to the end of the road and we're like, oh, okay, that's the end of the road. And then an expander archetype comes along and is like, oh, let me just open that up for everybody so that you all can follow and flow into that. And so I feel like expander archetypes aren't always on the center stage, but they always bring people to their stage. So, um, and then the last one is the creator archetype. And we're all doing this, right? I created if you will, I, I, I created, I guess you can say astral therapy. I created, you know, my book or whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, but I'm, I, it's not the one I live in all the time. Creator archetypes, you guys have a nonstop, it must be overwhelming flow of new creative ideas, whether it's music or poetry or tech ideas, um, art, it doesn't stop. And you only share a fraction of it with the world. And you're really good at hiding too. I think a lot of creator archetypes, yeah, creator archetypes, they kind of, they almost feel like everything coming through them, like the world's not even ready for it. And I feel like they do hide. And then the, the but the funny thing is that it, I think that can frustrate them that they're not seen because I think that creator archetypes are some of the most precious right now, because we do need more people creating from their soul to move into the higher realms um, and to move into a higher age, I will say. And so they, I think it both frustrates them, but it also relieves them of like, oh yeah, okay, nobody sees my brilliance. 
So those are the four, you know, very quickly skimming over it. Those are the four soul archetypes. And that's what I brought back because then you can be in your parenting moment and saying, okay, oh, this is an overwhelm. I'm just going into my, you know, connector archetype or you know, I don't have a soul sucking job. I'm actually using my expander archetype all day and then moving through different ones throughout the day. And then I think we have a season where we're more in one um, than the other, but you have all of them throughout the day. You have all of them throughout your life and you've always used them. So that was what I received during my NDE. If we get back to astral therapy, when you're guiding people, are there common patterns of blockages that people have? Yeah, I would say most of the patterns I see are worthiness, worthiness to really unapologetically live the assignment on their soul, unapologetically shine that light. And it's, it's, it's a, you know, it comes from different things. It could be a conditioning from this life or a past life, but a lot of people feel like there's a bigness there, but they're supposed to do. And they just feel like, I don't know if I can do that. Right. Um, there's also a lot of, obviously, I think just being human, right. Childhood wounds that I see a lot of, you know, um, a lot of the, the ways that we were brought up that maybe even well-meaning adults when you're a kid kind of shut down your, your psychic abilities or, or who you're really meant to be. Um, so I see a lot of that as well. Um, yeah, I, I'd say a lot of it is is the main thing I would say is people, again, I just wanted to, like to, to say it in sort of a broad way is people acting too human, meaning meeting the conditioning of the human. And it, I, I mean, I'm human. I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just saying like we we behave the way that we were brought up that we have to behave. And in terms of what we do, right? You go to school, you get a good job get married, have kids, do all the things. And I, I, you know, a lot of us do that and that's okay, but can you also shine that intergalactic light? Can you also, you know, raise your consciousness? You know, how, how, how else are you doing that on a daily basis? I've had near-death experiencers told that they have a purpose and came back, but they still never discovered it. As well as probably so many people out there don't know what their purpose is. So in your opinion, what's the best way to discover it? You know, take the pressure off. Honestly, I think people pressure themselves way too much. And I'm going to say your purpose is the most obvious thing about you. And the universe is not hiding it from you. I would say it's so it's like me, my purpose. So much of my purpose is to do astral therapy and share what happens in between lifetimes. It's the most obvious thing about me. It's the thing that I, it made me a little bit different, but it was also the thing that scared me the most. Um, and the biggest, the, the, the main purpose you have, and the reason I say take the pressure off is just to raise your consciousness a little bit every day, a little bit every day. That's it. When you leave this world, if that's all you did was continue to up level and raise your consciousness, you will have lived the life that you're meant to. That's it. We get so tangled up in, you know, what do I really do? And I think for some people being you is enough. Being that light is enough. Shining that light is enough. You don't know the effect you're having on the world around you. You don't know the effect on the, at the universe on, 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 that you're having all around you. And I think that we pressure ourselves way too much to have a tangible purpose. This is what I do, right? And it's lovely when that happens. But if you can't figure out what your purpose is, I always say it's like, you know, I need to wear glasses too sometimes, but it's like, you know, you ever leave the house and you cannot find your sunglasses anywhere and you're getting frustrated because you're late to an appointment and you can't find your sunglasses and you're looking all around and then you're like, oh my God, they're on my face. I feel like that's a lot with your purpose. It's already right. It's the most obvious thing about you. So take the pressure off, keep elevating your consciousness because again, the only thing you really bring with you is the spiritual progress you make a little, a lot, just make it. Don't compare it to anybody else. If you had a friend that was suffering over the loss of a loved one, what type of advice would you give? That's so hard, you know, because we're human and we feel human emotions and we're here to be human. Like as much as I tease and say, stop acting so human, what I mean is elevate your consciousness. Um, but we are here to experience human. We, we, we are here to experience and have this human experience. And I think the, the, the array of human emotions is part of it. The suffering is part of it. And you know, as somebody who has gone to the other side, your loved one is fine. You know, they're soaring in bliss. They're good. Um, 
I, I send, you know, I had both my parents pass away in the same year. The same year that I became a mother was the year my parents died. And it was a lot. But all I could do was send them love and release, you know, and that's hard because it's not always a parent who dies. Sometimes it's a child. And it's like, how do you let that go? It's not the same. It's not, there's no ease in that. That's not how things are supposed to be. And, you know, I can say in the higher consciousness, oh, it's all one. It's all. No, that sucks. It's terrible. I would say just stay in that, like continually sending love and feeling their love because the love is the one unconditional thread. It doesn't leave. It doesn't, it doesn't die. Nothing changes. You know, I still, I have, I have, a, I have several people who have left and some of them left early, you know, friends who died young. And I just feel that unconditional thread of love between us that connects us, but I don't pull on them. I don't, I don't pull. I just feel that love. And I would recommend, you know, that, and it's hard though. I won't, you know, I won't say it's easy. A lot of people make the recommendation to raise your consciousness, but I feel that's such a blanket statement. So what are your recommendations to do that? You know, I think you have to find what works for you, right? It, it's easy to say, oh, go meditate. Well, that doesn't work for everybody. You know, if it, if it would have worked, it would have worked the first time. <laughs> it would have worked the second time. Like I, I do meditate, by the way, and I do meditate every every day and I have for for years and years. But I, I also recognize it doesn't work. So it's like, what puts you in a higher state of feeling good? Because right there, you're in a good consciousness, right? If you're feeling happy, if you're feeling love, for me, when I'm stressed out or like just overwhelmed, right? Sometimes there's just a lot in, in a day and I just need to get out in nature. And for that, that just puts me back in a higher state of being. So really, I think that the higher state of consciousness comes from like, well, the question of how am I feeling right now? Am I feeling good? Am I feeling lit up about my life? Am I feeling exhausted? Am I feeling overwhelmed? Okay. If those are, if that's what you're feeling, that's a clue to where your mind is at, where your consciousness, it doesn't mean you're not high consciousness. It just means in that moment, you're letting things get to you. Like you're letting things get in your energetic field. So how do you clear that? Do you receive energy work? Do you go on a walk? Do you meditate? Do you, you know, I, I live in San Diego. Some people, I, they surf, right? It just clears them, breath work. You find what works for you that puts you in a state of love, of joy, of happy. And I don't wanna say happy because happy, sad, it's opposite, opposite. But really as the soul, you are joy. You are love, you are bliss, you are peace. So whatever puts you back in feeling that awareness of, oh yeah, underneath all of this stuff going on in my life, I am love. There you go. There's your consciousness. You know, it's not about raising like you're going to become more love. It's really a shifting out of the identity of the person you are and shifting into that. Oh yeah, I'm the soul. There I am. You know, and I often ask myself, and it's worked for years for me, but I often ask myself, who's the I that's so pissed off right now? Oh, okay. That's well, not me. Oh, all right. That's my ego. That's, that's my human, whatever. And, and that actually, that question that I asked myself brings me back. Who's the I that's so frustrated. And immediately it's like, my soul's like, you're good. Go deal with it. Go do whatever you got to do. Yes. It's overwhelming. It's a lot, whatever's happening. Right. So I don't know that that helps for me. I don't know if it, hopefully it helps some other people, but do what makes you feel good for me. You know, some audible books, Sometimes it's a movie. Sometimes you do just got to get in your human. And, and like, I have favorite movies that just make me happy. You know, I have books. You can imagine I like time travel books. <laughs> Big shocker there. I do. Sometimes I joke that I feel like a time traveler. Um, things like that just make me happy. So I think we, we pressure ourselves way too much, way too much. You're already it. How do I raise my consciousness? How do I like be it? You are it. You know, it's like walking around. How do I become more human? I, I just, I really wish I had like human qualities, like hair and nails and eyeballs. And like, I wish I could be more human. Well, you are human, right? It, it's like that with a soul. We forget who we are. And then we try so hard, but really you are it. Even if you, I don't think anyone here is a low conscious being, but like, let's just say four low conscious beings, they are also high conscious beings because we're all one. So I hate to have that duality. I don't know how to describe it in human words. Um, but I feel like a lot of you listening feel what I'm saying and my intention around that, but we are all one. So 
it, it is like that remembering who you are. It, it, maybe think of that instead of raising my consciousness, which puts a lot of pressure. And then we have this another hierarchy that pops in of like, oh, well, enlightenment's only for Buddha or Christ or Krishna or whoever. Oh, I could never be that. And then you dim your light. So however you get back into, or maybe it's the first time. So however you tune into your soul, whether it's playing in a rock band, whether it's taking a walk, whether it's yoga retreats, I don't care. It's going to be different for everybody. And there's not a right way or a better way. I would say, you know, if it's some people, you know, for my husband, he loves playing music and that just like taps him into his soul, you know, and he's just beaming after he's, you know, after he plays his guitar for a while. And for other people, they need to go do yoga every day. And some people meditate and some people surf. It just depends. For me, for a long time, it was rock climbing. I didn't even know it was happening. I didn't know. I, I was like, you know, when I started, I was young. I was like 18. I didn't know that that was what was happening. But every time I climbed, I was just like, ah, I feel, I feel good. So just do that. Take the pressure off. Mariko, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they connect with you? You know, I think the best way is I have a free Facebook group. And we can put the link in here. And in my free, it's, it's, it's growing, but I do do intuitive readings right now. I don't know if I'll do them forever because it's, it's just getting so big. I can only reach so many people. Um, but I do have that Facebook uh, community that I, I am like in contact with people every day. Um, and that's probably, you know, I have Instagram, Facebook, my website. But if you want to be in my community, the, the, the Facebook group is probably the best place. Do you have anything that you're working on that you want people to know about? That I'm working on. Um, as far as work, business, I have a, you know, like I said, I do an astral therapy. There's an astral therapy in my group that you can experience for free. Find your purpose, clear what's blocking you. I always have that up. And then I have a membership that I created. Um, and this is really, like I mentioned, these people that I feel like are higher realm beings and they've forgotten who they are. And I want to wake them up, clear whatever is blocking them, shift them into their soul assignment, get them moving. So I have a, a low cost membership that I just created um, that, that you can also check out. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I would say, be who you already are. There's nothing more you need to do, right? And so you as the soul, who you are, the, the soul blueprint is enough. Be that. You are already enough. You were born enough and you're always going to be enough. It's only the human thoughts that make you think that you're not in any way. I'm saying enough, but it could be a lot of other, uh, other human conditionings. Who you are, are right now is perfect. And then from there, how do you want to express the greatest version of your soul? What does that feel like today? Is it planting a garden? Is it going on a walk? Is it having a deep conversation with someone. And all of those things are enough because everybody here truly is perfect. Mariko, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.